The Lord be with you. Welcome to Black Mountain Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're here. Members, guests, this is a place to be home, a place to circle back to if you're visiting, and a place to grow in. We are delighted you're here. Please sign in on the uh, pew cards, if you, especially if you're a guest. And if you have a prayer concern, we would take that. The flowers today are um, a wonderful symbol and memory of David Kaler. We had his memorial service yesterday. Many of you knew him and um, valued his presence among us. And he was very involved with um, biblical studies through his life, but while he was here, he sort of led the way with a lot of our earth care work. So these flowers are a wonderful testament to his presence. We have a lot going on as we move into the year, and I just want to remind you of a few things. First, um, we have t-shirts for sale. We want to keep our name in front of everyone. Chelsea Goins did this beautiful collage, and we've converted it to a t-shirt. And then our picnic is coming up on September 11th. And everyone, I hope everyone will make it, make it out there. There is a deck next to Lake Eden, and then there's indoor area, swimming area, and a, everything for all ages. We'll have a worship service after lake time uh, at 4.30, we'll have a, a short Vesper service, and then we have a potluck picnic to, to close the day. It's a great way to return to our community together. It's outdoors, so it's a nice, safe place. Also, we are celebrating the opening of the church house. We still don't have the right name for it, so keep bringing names. We don't think church house is enough. Okay. So, and it, right now, a picture of Wayne Mullis with Mullis House on it might be the default. That, I don't know. Or, <laughs> but anyway, we're, we're excited. So on the, on, um, on the 11th, we're going to have a, a nice little gathering up there just to open it up. You can walk through. It'll be an open house time on that day as we return to our our fall schedule. And then Sunday school classes start the following week. So we're really excited about all of that and glad to see you all. Now let us begin our worship with the gift of music. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. The Lord forgives our iniquities, heals our diseases, redeems our lives, and crowns us with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord satisfies us with good as long as we live so that our youth is renewed like the eagles.
Please be seated. Our God is a God who waits for us, a patient God, a God who expects us to share ourselves, to open our hearts and minds to the Almighty. Friends, together let us share these words of confession in this prayer of confession before God and one another. Let us pray. Gracious God, you embrace all people with love and compassion. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We confess to you our sins, for they are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. We have ignored the suffering of others and walked by our neighbors in need. Forgive what our lips tremble to name and what our hearts can no longer bear. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we will be changed. Grant us the grace to grow more and more into the likeness of Jesus. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting like the waters of this world. Believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. When we know God's deep shalom inside us and in community, we cannot help but share it. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Come on up, Ruth. <laughs> Come on up. Hey, hey, good to see you. Children, come on up to the front. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a guest today who's getting ready to take a giant trip. This is Jesse Stitt. And Jesse, you want to just sit up but right there at the top? Give her a little room there. There we go. Hello, Nathan. So one of the great things that's happening always at our church, you guys, is we have people that travel around the world, and they go to places, and they have friendships. And they help people with all kinds of things. And Jesse has been doing this amazing thing many times. How many times have you been to Malawi for this Seven times Jesse has been over, and she's heading out for how long? I'm going for 
seven weeks. For seven weeks. And you, what she's doing is people have been drilling wells over there for fresh water. And this mission that Jesse is a part of helps everyone keep this rolling and keeping the wells being dug and the water flowing so people can get fresh water near their homes. And what do the people do when they get a well? Are they, are they really excited? They're very excited. We get to dance and sing sometimes. They get to dance and <laughs> sing. They get to celebrate. Because what would happen if you didn't have a well in your town? Can you imagine, you guys? If you don't have water, no, no sinks in the house, no water running, you'd have to walk somewhere to get it. And sometimes, how far do they sometimes have to walk, Jesse? 100 million miles. Maybe. That's a little far, but how far? It's close to that. Three miles? Three miles? It would be like walking. It'd be like walking up the mountain, kind of, here. A long way. Just to get water. Just to get water. So we're going to pray for Jesse as she heads out. And we have all these other missionaries. We have one person in the Ukraine in Romania. We have someone in Taiwan, someone in Madagascar, someone in Somalia or Ethiopia, and just all over Sudan, just places all over the world. And Jesse's going to fly. How long is the flight, the airplane flight? Way long. Way long. Is it, is it, like, is it like 24 hours? hours? Is it over a day? 22 hours. 20, 22 hours. And eight minutes. And eight minutes. All right. So let's pray together and pray Jesse off to this mission. Let us pray. Oh, God, we are thankful. Repeat after me. Oh, God, we are thankful. Oh, God, we are thankful. For our missionaries. For our missionaries. For Jesse. For Jesse. Who goes to bring fresh water. Who goes to bring fresh water. So that people may drink wonderful water. So that people may drink wonderful water. We thank you for Jesse. We thank you for Jesse. And the water of life. And the water of life. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. If you and are three years old through kindergarten, you're going to go back there with Miss Cheryl. Do you see Miss Cheryl back there? So that's if you're three years old through kindergarten, you can go back there with Miss Cheryl. The rest of you may go sit with your worship partners, okay? Okay. All right. We'll see you. Thank you. It is a great joy for me to be with you over these seven weeks to explore the parables of Jesus together. Last week we looked at the parable of the prodigal and today the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let us join together in prayer. Holy Jesus, you are the living water. May you well up within us and become a spring of life-giving water. May your spirit dwell richly within us that we may behold you in the world in which we live, in the eyes of those around us, and in our own eyes that see deeply within ourselves. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our first lesson is the familiar words from the prophet Micah, the sixth chapter, beginning at the sixth verse. Hear now God's word. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice? to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And here also this word, this teaching of Jesus from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, the story of the Good Samaritan. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. 
And Jesus said to him, You've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hand of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, and when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go. And do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Now, Jesus has a way of turning things inside out and upside down. Think about this parable. A teacher of the law asked Jesus a simple question Well, who is my neighbor? And he tells the answer to the question by telling the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which ends with its own question. But Jesus turns it upside down. Who acted like the neighbor to the man who fell upon thieves? And the story itself kind of inverts things. It follows an unexpected pattern. For in the manner of such stories, one would expect the priest or the Levite, members of the religious establishment, to be the ones that helped the man in the ditch to do the right thing. The surprise of the parable is that the despised Samaritan appears in the story to do what the religious leaders failed to do. He acts with compassion after the priest and the Levite pass by the man in the ditch. He reframes the question to ask who acted like the neighbor. And the teacher of the law, did you hear it? Cannot even use the despised word Samaritan. He says, the one who showed mercy. You know, we've lost all sense of the scandal of calling a person a Samaritan or calling a Samaritan good. In fact, the phrase good Samaritan has been attached to so many things. It's embedded in our culture. It's become a part of the way we think in everyday language. We give out good Samaritan awards. We name hospitals that care for the poor, good Samaritan hospitals. We even have laws, the good Samaritan law that protects people who maybe in an accident or crisis, help someone in their unfortunate, unintended consequences, the law protects them. But in short, the Good Samaritan is the one who shows compassion. Now, in the English language, compassion is a noun, but it ought to be a verb. It's both in the original Greek. Did you know that? And I don't want to get too graphic here, but... You know what the word means in Greek? Bowels. The seat of deep emotion. We might say it a little more nicely. I had a gut feeling about that. (laughs) I was stirred in my bowels. I like to get church a little R-rated, you know. Jesus says that when the Samaritan came to the man who had been beaten, robbed, stripped, and left for dead by the robbers, he felt compassion for him. He was stirred in the deepest part of his being with feeling. He was led to action. There were no clothes to identify with the man's status, nationality, or religion. He couldn't even be sure if the man was still alive. Ooh, touch a dead body. But Jesus tells us that the Samaritan went to him, bound his wounds, poured oil and wine on his bruised flesh, set him on a donkey, took him to an inn, poured out his pocketbook, gave money to the innkeeper, and then on his way back came back to check on him and pay any tab left at the hotel. 
Compassion looks like a series of small but demanding concrete actions that lead to life, restore health. It's what the prophet Micah talks about, verbs. The prophet Micah expresses our obligations before God in a series of verbs. What? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God. Compassion is a noun, but it ought to be a verb. True compassion fits the needs of a situation. You know, you don't charter an airplane to pull a person out of a ditch. You don't shop for a formal gown at Saks Fifth Avenue to close a naked person. You don't post on Facebook about how good you are to help and console a lonely person. No. True compassion is about very few words, but about appropriate action. True compassion demands something of us. It takes us out of our way. It lightens our grasp on our wallets. It cracks open our hearts. It opens our eyes. Yet compassion, even as we say, is always a blessing. For such action breaks down boundaries. It makes us aware of people whose lives and, and situations are different from our own. It changes our way of thinking and even our way of living. Compassion is a noun, but it ought to be a what? A verb. Compassion, one of the great attributes of Jesus in the scriptures. You know, his compassion embodies the compassion of God. Three of the 12 uses of the word compassion in the New Testament confer to, con, refer to Jesus' compassion for those with a particular needs. A grieving mother, a leper, a blind person. And what does he do? Talk them out of it? No. He acts. Five times the gospel tells us that when Jesus sees the hungry crowds, He's stirred deeply within his own being. He's got a gut feeling for them. He has compassion upon them. And what does he do? Tell them to go home and get something for themselves? No. He feeds the hungry crowds. The word compassion is used in three parables. Where? The prodigal son, the good Samaritan, and the king who has compassion for the one who owes him a great debt. In all these parables, we see God's compassion displayed in human actions. Brandon Scott has noted that the parables themselves invite us to see a new world that is characterized by God's vision and God's activity. How many of you years ago read Ron Sider's incredible book, Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger? It opened my eyes. I always thought, you know, that, that hunger was just an insolvable problem. I never forget his words. The problem with hunger in the world is not what we think. It's not the lack of food. It's the lack of will to feed a hungry world. But wait, I thought. But wait. You've got it wrong. Oh, no. You've got it right. He helped us reimagine feeding a hungry world from God's eyes, from God's point of view. I don't know about you, but like that poor beleaguered teacher of the law, you know, I want to dissect the definition of neighbor so that I can redefine or whittle down my obligations and my opportunities to help others. You know, make it as small as possible. And just when I'm whittling all that down, Jesus comes and, and, and blows a hole as big as Texas in our carefully constructed defenses against helping others. Bernard Scott writes that Jesus envisions a world, a new world, in which the divisions between them and us no longer exist, and even more than that, where one of them can come to the aid of one of us. We want to avoid vulnerability. Oh, but the gospel makes us vulnerable to others. We cannot seal ourselves off from Jesus in our little houses of prayer. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And claim to follow Jesus if we ignore our neighbors. 
I tend to ask, well, who deserves it? But Jesus says, who needs it? The parable encourages us to start not with a philosophical question about who is our neighbor, but with concrete actions in response to the neighbor whose needs are, bam, right there before us. We may wonder what we should do in a particular situation, but the more appropriate question is, well, hey, friends, what needs doing? Get on it. If we want to share the gospel of Christ, then we meet others at the point of their need. In a small church community in Duplin County, where we began our ministry, we witnessed time and again how the community would come together to be neighbors, to help out their neighbors and their friends and even their strangers in times of crisis. When the local Georgia Pacific plant laid off workers, food would appear on the front steps or maybe money slipped through the mail slot. A broken down car would be fixed. An old man's house would be repaired and painted. And just a few days after we moved to that small town, my father died unexpectedly. Suddenly, right before our ordination, we had to, had to leave town to go for the funeral about four hours away in my hometown. And just as we were about to leave leave town, a, a deacon in the church, in the country church, whose job it was to cut the grass along the highways, he worked for the county, had a big scar across his face with a bailing wire that caught up in his mowing machine had scarred him for life. He slipped a $20 bill in my pocket as we left town and said, you might need this. And when we came back, The house was clean, the kitchen packed with food, the yard freshly mowed, concrete actions that were visible signs of the compassion of God, and hardly a word was spoken. If we want to live in the kingdom neighborhood, then we can't ignore the needs of the neighbor that are right there before us. No matter what culture, race, class, sexual identity, or religion they have. In our global society, we find that the people we once considered to be strangers might be living right next to us, attending our schools, healing our wounds, repairing our streets, working in our offices. And with modern technology and communication, the needs of the neighbor halfway around the world, like digging clean water in Africa, seem as close to home as the schools and shops and places of business around the corner. Years ago, we went back to that same small town where we started our ministry. Some things were the same. Some things never changed. Some things had changed. It was exciting to see that that church was still thriving and doing what it had always done well, caring for one another, gathering for worship, nurturing the faith of children. But the community had changed. Once Latino migrant laborers who came and went with the growing seasons, who were treated like third-class citizens or maybe fourth-class citizens if they were citizens. But now, after all those years, things had changed. The area had many Latino residents, schools, and children filled with people whose primary languages were Spanish, and signs in, in shops and restaurants in Spanish But the same spirit of caring for neighbors continued. Only now the walls had fallen down. Black and white, Anglo-Latino living together in one community and practicing the grammar of compassion. Compassion is a noun, but it ought to be a verb. Such an expansive redefinition of neighbor invites our compassion fatigue. I know it. I've felt it. You have too. How can I care for everyone whose needs are known to me? Sometimes we we just get so overwhelmed, we don't even know where to start. We don't even want to start. We go home, we pull down the blinds, we turn off the lights, we pray nobody will ring that doorbell. But the parable? The parable invites us to begin where we can with what we have. The parable invites us to take those small, concrete steps of compassion. It's not about the grand gesture. No, that's not what counts. It's about going to the one in the ditch 
near our yard, binding the wounds, pouring the oil and the wine, caring for the need, giving what we have to give, and seeing that the one in need is on the right path to health and wholeness. The parable. The parable is about what happens on a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. The parable is about what happens in the schools that we attend, the places where we work on any road we travel. The parable is about what happens wherever compassion is shown. A young woman I know named Margaret had a colleague in the arts, a colleague who had a friend who was evicted or had to leave her home and didn't have another place to live. Her friend was a young mother who was HIV positive with a two-year-old child. And so my friend Margaret and her husband invited her to come and live in their home. She stayed there for four months, limited income. I don't know about you, but having a new two-year-old running around the house, that's for young people. It was tiring. It took effort. It took small daily acts of compassion. But you know what? There's always a blessing. There's always a blessing. Compassion always comes with a blessing. For these folks, a deepened friendship, a stable life, finally a new home to live with her daughter, and a mother and a little girl so alone in the world now have a home, now have friends they think of as family. Oh, this so familiar parable is about people of faith and vision who catch a glimpse of what God's kingdom and God's kingdom is all about, where barriers are broken down, where there's no more us and them, where people share whatever gifts they have, whatever talents are needed. It's about big-hearted people like you who refuse to turn away from those in need. It's about you and me who've learned the grammar of compassion. Compassion is a noun, but it ought to be a verb. Amen. Jesus, teach us to be neighbors, living, loving, side by side. Hands for helping one another, arms of welcome open wide, ever learning, ever growing. Jesus, teach us all to be children of the new creation, joined in true community.
remain standing, if you would, and reach for your hymn books because we are going to affirm our faith together using the sung version of the Apostles' Creed, hymn number 481. be seated. Pray with me. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, for family visiting, for children coming forward and joining us in worship, for preachers who give up summer Sundays for music which lifts our spirits, for a choir that lifts our voices. At the same time, we come to pray for the world and all that is in it. God of justice, work your will in our world. Free us to speak your word in a world that needs to listen to you. Greed in sport, health care, politics has overta- overtaken the land and ambition has taken place of the values you expect from us. Injustice has taken hold, making the rich richer and the poor poorer. Give us your voice that your church can be a servant, guiding your people to your will to the world. God of compassion, work your will in our world. Free us to tend to those in this world who need your loving care, whether that be in Afghanistan, Somalia, Gaza, Ukraine, or right around the corner. You always care especially for those abandoned or rejected. Give us eyes to recognize them in our midst. Use us to deliver them from all that would harm or oppress. God of impartiality, work your will in our world. Free us from asking who is our neighbor. Take pity on us that we might show compassion. Anoint us and bandage our wounds so that we might do the same for those in need. Carry us and give us strength to carry others. Heal your aching world we pray. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus, 
who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As a redeemed people, we live for giving thanks. We understand that everything we do, and everything we have, comes from God, whose unconditional love lifts us up each day. Let us continue our thanksgiving with grateful hearts by giving of what God has provided. Thank you, God. You are our soil, our food, our water, our sun, everything we need to grow. We offer these gifts to you 
asking for your direction as we work each day so that your kingdom becomes more and more of a reality in this world. Amen. We go from this place into the world, into the kingdom of God among us. Keep your eyes open for the compassion of God, which surrounds and fills us all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.